Okay, so we should be live streaming, and I want to start by sharing a document here. Give me just a second, and I've got to hit pause on this. Come on. Okay, there's that, and let me go here. All right, there we go, and let's make this bigger. So just... Uh, I think it's worth it to discuss some deadlines and things. And I'll, I think I just gave this to you in the chat. Hopefully you could follow this there if you want to just read ahead. And I sent an email last week, but sometimes it's nice to see it in table form. I know an email is not the best. So here's your deadlines coming up. You can see there's a lot of stuff. A lot of this stuff is easy, but if you don't know when it's due and you miss it, I know Canvas sometimes is mediocre at best at giving you reminders. So the homework check, we were just talking about that with Jose. That's due Tuesday, May 4th at 11.59 p.m. Then you have a chapter 15 lecture quiz. This Thursday, Trey will probably be there, but I'll be there for sure. Uh, just to answer questions. There is no lab. It's optional. But you're probably going to want to come in if you have a question on a practice exam. So uh, you could do practice exams, uh, et cetera. Uh, Oh, notice on the chapter 13 quiz, you're going to get two questions. Uh, well, four questions, essentially. A concept question and a problem on energy. And then uh, a 3D force calculation and a 3D force um, concept question. And to be honest, these are somewhat similar to possible exam questions. So, uh, you know, give it your honest shot on, on Wednesday. And then if you're bad at it, you could study those and probably improve and be much stronger for the uh, final. So that's what I was saying about chapter 13 is coming up a lot. It's right here. It's right here. And it's probably going to be on the uh, oral exam or the final. Where's the final? There it is, the written exam. So it's going to be on there. And of course, it could be on the oral too. So if you have not done a good job on chapter 13, between now and tomorrow night, you better, you know, rock that. Okay. Um, wait a minute. I don't know who Ace is. Hold on a second. Who's Ace? All right. Uh, Ace, tell me in the chat who you are, will you? Thanks. All right. I think that it was Sophia. She just changed her name right now. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Sorry about that, Sophia. Just make it sure. Normally, I check that before I let people in and I forgot. Sorry about that. I don't know. Okay. Um, so, hey, check this out by Friday, May 7th do the honor pledge for zero points or don't do it and get negative 40. The choice is yours. Okay. There's the honor pledge is essentially all the instructions for the exam, making it clear what I expect in terms of, you know, what is allowable, what is not. And if you read that and sign it, I'm going to hold you to it. And if it becomes obvious, you didn't do that. I'm reporting you to the uh, vice president and see if I can get you kicked out of school. Whereas if you just be honest, there's nothing to worry about. So all right. If you haven't already done so, schedule your oral exam. The uh, number of appointments left is shrinking rapidly. So I'm going to say do that by Friday night. Okay. Now, um, next week, Monday. Oh, whoops. The time is off. <laughs> that should say during class. I'll have to fix that. Oh, geez. before I send this out to you. But so um, that should say, um, LAP students, uh, I'm gonna try and figure out those deadlines today. Um, oh, my bad, no, no problem, Sophia. All right, um, so this one's gonna be during class on Monday. Uh, so I know a lot of you, are like paranoid or for some reason don't want to join me on Zoom. I, I think that's crazy. Um, if something comes up during the test, if you're in Zoom in your own breakout room, 
it's easy. You just say, Hey, call me over. And I just come help you out right away. And there's none of this emailing back and forth. So I highly recommend that. I mean, I rarely have to use it with students, but it's there as a, right. If you're on my zoom, you could just pop in at the beginning before you start taking the test. That's one less thing on your mind during the test. So it's not required, but you're welcome to join me and I'll give you your own breakout room. You just sit there and you work in your breakout room and call me if you have questions. Uh, be aware, you should plan on being online for the entire test, just in case. I have no clue what you're gonna wanna have online. For example, what if you're doing a problem, you're like, gosh, I just want Wolfram Alpha to do this for me. In particular, there's one question I told you, why don't you just do this with Wolfram Alpha instead of making, you know, hard, making it hard on yourself. So some problems will actually have numbers and you could use them. You could be using the internet uh, for Wolfram Alpha. Obviously you shouldn't be using Discord to talk with your fellow students, but um, yeah. Uh, all right, LAP, I'm gonna schedule you later today. Um, by the way, it's your responsibility to ensure adequate internet. I warned you about this at the start of the semester. I talked about it last time. I'm emphasizing it again today. It's not my fault if the internet goes out on you, even no matter how sympathetic I am, I have no way of telling the difference between someone who's trying to cheat and get extra time and somebody that honestly is having their internet go down. And there's just no way for me to tell. And I'm not going to try to take that effort because it's impossible. So if your internet goes down, I'm sorry, but you're gonna lose points. So um, if you're late, you lose lots of points. Okay, after that, that's Monday, May 10th, during class, you've got a couple of things. Afterwards, there's a post-test. This is easy. Go in, just see how you do, and see if you're better or worse. All right, that's kind of the fun part of the class. See if this class made you worse at physics. All right, and then the oral exam. Okay, that's various times next week, uh, Monday, May 11th, or Tuesday, May 11th through uh, May, Friday, May 14th. And all this stuff you want to have with you, your work exam. Now, be, to be clear, after the written exam is done, after 7 p.m. that night, I encourage you to go on Discord, talk to your neighbor, whatever you can do to learn the stuff on the test that you failed, right? That could be questions you didn't answer, right? But I'm going to ask you about that during the oral exam. To be clear, you should get there five minutes early and expect to wait up to five minutes late, right? All kinds of weird stuff happen during that. Um, and so it's, I feel like I'm a dentist or a doctor where no matter what I do, somehow there's always a delay that propagates through. And so that's why I have to book, I've booked in like every three or four appointments a break. But if you're the last one out of four appointments in a row, almost certainly I'm going to be running five minutes late. But just so you know, I'm going to make sure you get your full time if we start late. So everybody's going to get their full 25 minutes, even if, you know, something comes up where I'm having to type something in and get slowed down and whatever. All right. Finally, there's this cheesy little survey I've made. I want you, whoops. Oh, I want you to make sure you do that. It's anonymous. All right. I know this class has been mediocre or bad, however you want to look at it. And I know a lot of you might not think I'm trying. <laughs> I'm working my ass off. I'm just doing a bad job. All right. So uh, that it's not for lack of trying. It's for just this, this is hard. Just like this class is hard for you. It's hard for me. And I'm sorry. Uh, that said, maybe there's something you can answer in there that might we could try to focus on getting some positive stuff, some constructive feedback out of this. So that's why I want you to do that survey. Take a deep breath and be honest about it and just get it over with. Yep, yep. Now, to be honest, the internet there, I just saw Gage's comment there, right? Odds are you'll only need the internet to download the test and work on the paper, then to upload it, right? And so you're gonna, I'm gonna split it into two submissions. So you're gonna download the first part, upload the first part. And as, as you're uploading the first part, you can download the second part and then upload the second part at the end. So I'm going to make two separate uploads. And I think that will be easier for everybody involved. Um, 
I don't know. I hope so. Because then you're only uploading four or five pages at a time. All right. So uh, any questions about what's due, what's coming, I'll send that file to you via Canvas with that update. Any questions about that stuff? Just to clarify for the um, yeah. different portions of the exam, is it going to be where, for example, we get the first portion and then we have to be done with it and upload it at that time and then work on the next part? That's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to have, I'm going to give you basically an hour and uh, 10 minutes for the first part and an hour and 10 minutes for the second part. Plus I'm going to give you 15 minutes for upload problems and download problems as well. So you should get, uh, or maybe it's an hour and seven minutes or something, but yeah. Um, basically I'm going to split the class time in half, add 15 minutes for uploading one, 15 minutes for uploading the other one and call that good. So the total class time should be about two hours, 15 minutes, plus 15 minutes on either end. Okay. Got it? Yeah. And yeah, so um, that's my plan. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Um, and that just keeps us below the Chegg time limit. And obviously, I know there's all these other ones too, but um, it just kind of... Uh, I know it seems silly for me to care about academic integrity during this time. But it's funny, the more I hear about this, I'm starting to see clips on the internet on YouTube or hearing things from counselors about all these students that are saying, now I'm kind of worried because I cheated my way through class. I'm going to be screwed when I transfer. It's like, yeah, yeah, totally. However, maybe I'm wrong. I feel like I've tried my best to keep you somewhat honest and say what you will about the Canvas quizzes that suck. They suck. I know it. You know it. Lack of partial credit sucks, and it's not, it's not for a lack of time. I mean, I tried a lot, and I put a lot of time into those. That doesn't mean it's a good experience. It's bad. But having to be accountable for individual effort that's kind of challenging to cheat on is going to pay off later, and I think you guys will rise to the top at the next level. I'd like to think I've kept you honest a little bit and kept you working a little bit. So. I have a feeling in a couple of years, all these people that skated through in those easy classes where they could just check everything and cheat their asses off. I have a feeling you're going to be slightly better than them. Fingers crossed. I don't know. So um, we'll, only time will tell. And I do apologize that my class was not as easy as everybody else's where you could just cheat and copy the answers off the internet all the time. Only some of the time. Yeah. All right. So school what a weird experience right i don't know all right um let's get to fluids and wrap this thing up today oh and before i forget i'm gonna put this in the chat so i outlined some questions here i don't know what i wrote down before i'll send this again later but i'm gonna put them in Sorry if there is a smarter way to do this. This is what I'm thinking of. Okay, so there's the question numbers that I looked at before class that I think are most useful. And um, if you want, I'm going to give you an even reduced subset that I think you'd be insane not to do. Okay, so the first number is all the ones I highly, highly, highly recommend. And the, the next set is the bare minimum that you're going to fail if you don't, you'll, you'll fail that question if you don't do that. I won't tell you exactly which question's showing up, and it's not exactly like those, but it's pretty darn similar to uh, one of those. Uh, so there's a couple different options on your finals. And I think what you'll see is um, now I can start talking about fluids and generally speaking, the three concepts we're going to try and focus on. All right. All right, so I think I did that. That was the chat and the end of semester checklist, done. 
Okay. So the fluids concepts that we want to learn. This is chapter 14. The first one we're going to start with is pressure uh, uh, versus force. The differences, the similarities, how they relate. So that's one thing that we want to learn. The next will be pressure versus depth, assuming there's no flow in the water or, or lava or whatever fluid you want to talk about. All right. Next is buoyant force. All right. And then last. Whoops. We're going to do a very limited number of fluids in motion uh, problems. That's going to be our Bernoulli equation. Uh, that has to do with uh, energy. Bernoulli equation is basically conservation of energy for fluids. So notice the pattern that we've seen here. After doing all this work up to chapter 12, kind of learning the basics of torque, kinematics, forces, uh, momentum, angular momentum, all that stuff, chapter 13, what did we do? We took a new type of situation, universal gravitation, and we did forces and energy. Now we're doing fluids. What are we basically doing? How to understand forces and energy for fluid types of problems. What do we do in physics 163? Electric charge. How do we do force and energy? And then we add in a new concept in electric field. And then we do the same thing for magnetism. And then we throw in some circuits. So there's a pattern here that now that you've learned the first 12 chapters, we can start layering on complexity with special cases, certain types of forces. And that's what exactly we're going to do in chapter 14. Any questions before we start hitting this? All right, let's do it. So now I'm going to start with a simple equation. Pressure, well, let's, let's get some symbols here. This is pressure, capital P. That's how I'm labeling a capital P. To be clear, this is very different from momentum, which is a vector. It's different than density. That's the Greek letter rho, okay? So we've got to watch out for the symbols that look like P in physics. Capital P is going to be pressure for us, and uh, lowercase p is going to be momentum. Now, uh, so that's our symbols. In this case, pressure, one way to write this is force over area. Let's just write out the words for once. Now, you can see here I'm actually using a force magnitude over area. And so you probably know this already, right? If I take my hand and I press it flat against this board, or if I press just my fingertips, I could exert the same amount of force. But when you do a, use your fingertips, there's more pressure. Why? Right? Well, the area of my hand is smaller than the area of my fingertips. So I get, if I use fingertip push-ups, it hurts more because there's more pressure on my fingertips uh, than there is on my entire flat palm. So that's how I like to think about it. Now, in this case, imagine we have, uh, let's take, a, let's say we have a wall of a house here. All right. So, and let's say this is 10 meters tall. Uh, whoa, that's tall. Uh, how about three meters tall? That's, that would be a tall house. That'd be a multi-story. Let's say it's three meters tall. That's about 10 feet. 
by, um, and this is not to scale, let's say it's uh, 10 meters long. So this might be a long wall of a house. So that's about 30 feet. So 10 feet by 30 feet, this would be like a wall of a house. Sorry, it's not to scale. Let's say you're in some bad weather. Some bad weather comes in, the pressure outside drops. So let's say the uh, pressure outside is 10% less than normal. I'll explain what normal means. Okay, so let's say we have 10% less than normal pressure there, and this is outside the house. Now, obviously, I'm not drawing the rest of the house. I'm just drawing one wall of the house. Inside, let's say you have all the windows on your house closed. So it was closed before the weather turned bad. It's at normal pressure. Now, what do I mean by normal pressure? Any guesses? Maybe somebody from chemistry class? Um, probably like what, like one ATM, right? Or one ATM. Of- one ATM is a standard uh, unit in chemistry. We don't really like using ATMs in physics for reasons that will, it's basically from this equation. Look at the units on this. If we look up here at the units, what do you think the units of pressure is for a physicist? Newtons per centimeter square. Okay, but usually we use not meters. centimeters. Yeah, meters. newtons per meter squared. The unit of that is called a Pascal. So a Pascal is a unit of pressure. So it turns out the units of a Pascal are 1.013 times 10 to the fifth Newtons per meter squared. I know this sounds crazy, but do you agree this number is basically 10 to the fifth, approximately, right? Within 1% or so, 1.3%. So normal pressure means 10 to the fifth Newtons per meter squared. Think about this. If you lay out a sheet of paper on the ground that's one meter by one meter, the area of that is one meter squared. The weight of all the air up above you is 10 to the fifth Newtons. Again, if you have a one meter square area laying on the ground, the approximate weight of all the air up above it is 10 to the fifth Newtons. So the pressure of the atmosphere weighing down on a sheet of paper that's one meter squared is 10 to the fifth Newtons. And there's a small correction there. It's 1.013, okay, times 10 to the fifth. So that's where this number is coming from. It's just the weight of the air above one square meter is that number, 10 to the fifth Newtons. Now, you may know some other units. Maybe you've used tor or millitor or bar or millimeters mercury. So all of these are units that are discussed in the workbook and where they come from. The Torricelli barometer, right? Uh, And millimeters of mercury all relate to these things. I tell you what, there's another one that's not listed here. What's another unit of pressure if you've ever inflated a tire? PSI. PSI. What's PSI mean? Pounds per square inch? Yeah, pounds per square inch. Does anybody know approximately atmospheric pressure in PSI? About? It's okay if you don't. I'm going to say it's 14.7, about 15. Okay, so just remember 15 PSI. That's a good number. So that tells you if you had a one inch square on the ground, about like that. If you had a one inch square on the ground, 15 pounds of air all the way up to the top of the atmosphere. Okay, crazy. All right. Um, that's uh, the un- Any questions about the units and things like that yet? All right. So now what I want to do is it looks like we've got all these different units I'm going to use normal pressure is this number, okay? So I'm gonna erase everything here. One ATM for us and all these different units, let's just use one set of units. 
So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this P subscript zero. And I'm going to round for this problem. I'm just going to round off the one three for a second. All right. So now outside, what is the pressure? It's 10% less than normal. So we'd say P naught times 0 0.9. Well, that's equal to 0 0.9 times 10 to the fifth Newtons per meter squared. Sorry for that glare. It's so awkward there. Can I, uh, let me see if I can get this down a little bit. That's not much better. Sorry. How about this? There, that's a little better. All the zoom windows were giving a little extra glare there. Sorry about that. So now my question is this. What are the forces acting on this wall right now? This is one wall of the house. Give me one force that's acting on any object. What's a force that acts on a, on a chunk of wall? Mg. Mg. What's another force acting on this wall? What holds it up? Normal force. So there's a normal force. Do you agree these two should balance for the wall? Because it's not yeah. levitating and hopefully it's not sinking. All right. Now, here's where we get kind of crazy. There's a force from the inside. And there's a force from the outside. Which one is bigger? Outside force. Why do you think the outside force is going to be bigger? Because it had more Pascals? It has fewer. Wait, what's the... Oh, I'm sorry. I thought the other yeah. side was the outside. So this is what's kind of weird, and it's counterintuitive. When a tornado comes near your house, there's a pressure drop. Maybe you've ever watched the weather forecast and they're talking about, oh, we've got a low pressure front moving in. Watch out for thunderstorms. Oh, that's right. This is California. The weather's always perfect. In Illinois, where I grew up, right, you know, you could get tornadoes. And so if you see the pressure dropping, you're like, oh, crap, open the windows, get in the basement, hide in the shower. OK, so that's so you don't get killed. Uh, the, yeah, we had, we had a tornado go through my hometown when I was a kid. It was pretty scary, but what happens here is if you don't open the windows of your house, you have a high pressure inside a low pressure outside. Boom. The roof flies off. The roof goes up crazy, right? Yeah. We've got fire and earthquakes. So yeah, fair trade. Yeah. Although, uh, yeah, the, the new Madrid fault runs through there too. So, all right. But Here's the deal. This is what I want you to remember. There's a net force from high to low. This higher pressure overpowers that lower pressure. Okay? Also, think about your body right now. I have the same amount of air pushing on this side as on that side back here. And so right now, I don't feel like I'm being thrown back and forth by the air because I have the same amount of pressure on both sides. If you get a situation where you don't have the same amount of pressure, you have a force. Think about a tire that is inflated above 15 PSI. If you pump up a tire, it tends to blow out because there's a high pressure inside the tire, it blows out. If that helps you, obviously this should be basic, but um, just making sure you got that. So now if I could, Let's run the numbers. So in this case, now, oh, let me ask you one other thing. I'm assuming there's going to be another force here. There's going to be a force of the earth holding the wall this way. Uh, I'll call this force support for lack of a better phrase. So the idea right now is we know that there's going to be a tendency of this wall to blow out in this tornado, let's say, where there's low pressure outside. So that means the earth is going to have to hold it back from blowing out. 
So it might actually tip over rather because there's a torque now, right? Because you got a force here at the center and blah, blah, blah. All right. So that said, let's look at just the red force here. So what I want to do is I want to talk about the force due to this change in pressure. It's going to be the force from the high pressure, which is inside, minus the force from the low pressure outside. Now, if I do this, I want to use this equation up top, and I want to rearrange it for force. And what I see is, if pressure is force over area, force is pressure times area. Force is pressure times area. So what we get here, we'll get pressure uh, in times the area minus pressure out times the area. And then if I could go one step further, we could see that this is the change in pressure, a pressure difference, a pressure differential times area. So if you need to figure out a force associated with pressure, remember, typically we care about the net force on an object. So rather than getting, you, you could get each force separately and write each term as a pressure times an area, or you could get the change in pressure from one side to the other and say, I'll get that change in pressure times the area. That is equivalent. Okay. Notice in this case, delta P for us is how much? Point one. Point one. So let's just pop in the numbers and see how big this force is, people. So this one is going to be about 0 0.1 times 10 to the fifth. The area was 30 square meters. So it's three times 10 to the fifth Newtons. Yikes. That's a large force. Now, keep in mind, this is a pretty dramatic drop in pressure. 10% drop in pressure, that's really bad weather. So we're talking about tornado here. Um, all right. If you care, we're doing a variation on, what problem was this? We're chapter 14 now. <sighs> Sorry. If you look on page 127 in the workbook, I've got all the different units and stuff like this and where a lot of these come from. We basically just did a problem almost identical to 14.4, okay? So that one talks about the roof. And in that one, it looks like I saw a pressure drop of 15%. So I knew somebody that worked in uh, meteorology and I said, what's the largest pressure drop you've ever seen? And they said, well, I've seen it go up to 15% for a very short time. So that is based off real data that in theory, the atmosphere could drop 15%. That's an insane amount of force, right? All right. Uh, questions on that? So when we do these problems, do we always consider Pascal to be 10 to the fifth newtons per meter square? Or do, or do we use that 1.013? Yeah, you should probably use the 1.013 times oh, okay. 10 to the 10 to the fifth. Just to yeah. Now, to be honest, if you're trying to do anything with fluids, these numbers are so approximate, anyways. I argue our numbers are going to be off probably in that third decimal place, no matter what we do, because when you do fluids problems, you have to make a lot of assumptions. So uh from a practical standpoint, if you're doing real life engineering, probably 10 to the fifth is good enough. And to be honest, uh, I yeah, I think I tend to make these problems algebraic on the final exam anyway, so that shouldn't be okay. an issue. You know what I'm saying? Okay. All right. Good enough? All right. So let's keep rocking here. Um, so now, I did I show you guys that water is incompressible the other day? The hammer made out of glass that was filled up with water. Did I show you guys that video? Yeah. Yeah, so 
Okay, so I'm going to make some assumptions now about water. And let me, um, the most common fluid we like to think about is water. Probably the next one would be air. There's a big difference between water and air if you're doing fluids problems. Water is usually treated as incompressible, whereas air is a fluid, but obviously it's very compressible. There's compressed air cylinders, right? You've probably blown up a balloon and then inside of the balloon, the air is slightly compressed by the tension in the balloon membrane. So air is a compressible fluid, whereas uh, a lot of fluids we're going to assume are incompressible. So one way to think about it is water with no air bubbles in it. Obviously, this is not a perfect scenario, but for example, the ocean, you see waves with frothy white, there's tons of air bubbles in that frothy white stuff, uh, right? The white caps on the ocean waves. However, if you go deep below the ocean, yeah, the amount of air bubbles in there, obviously there's still air in the water, but we can approximately ignore that. If this is true, if you have an incompressible fluid, a fluid that cannot be compressed easily, it's obviously compressible if you apply enough force. It's just not easy to do it, right? You could stick it in a black hole or something. That's going to compress. But if it's approximately incompressible, this is something that we have discovered. Pressure as a function of depth is equal to atmospheric pressure at the surface plus density times G times H where H in this one is depth. I've emphasized the word depth twice here. I'll explain why when we get the fluids in motion. But the idea here is, let's say you have some fluid. Let's say this is a, a swimming pool. Okay, H is the depth in this equation. It's not a height above the bottom, okay? Okay, so that's supposed to be my fluid. So the idea is as you go deeper into the fluid, you have more pressure. This makes sense intuitively if you think about the air example I gave a minute ago. If there was more air on top of you, you'd have more air weighing down on you, there'd be more atmospheric pressure. So similarly, as you go deeper and deeper beneath the surface of a fluid, we expect there to be more pressure. So imagine a submarine going a thousand feet below the surface. This gets crazy, crazy. What do these things mean? Remind me, what is this symbol right here? The density. Density. Okay, and G, do you agree that's approximately 10? Approximately 10 meters per second squared? Let's do a quick calculation on this. How deep below the surface of a swimming pool do you need to go before atmospheric pressure doubles? How deep do we need to go below the surface to make atmospheric pressure double? Well what would I write down? I want to make atmospheric pressure double. What would you write down here? So P def would be twice uh, P surface. Okay. And let's say it's a normal day. So let's say the pressure at the surface is just atmospheric pressure. Got it? So I'm assuming it's a normal day. So P0 is the atmosphere. That's one ATM or 10 to the fifth, blah, blah, blah. Okay. What's the density of water? Approximately one. One what? Um, one gram per centimeter square. So what is, we have to convert that. Centimeter. To cube, sorry. The number is a thousand. Okay. Yikes. It's a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. Okay, so you could punch this in on Google or do the you know chapter one crap. So this would be rho g h. So in this case, if I subtract, 
I'd say P naught has to equal rho G H. Solve this for H, and what do you get? Now, again, I should put in approximately here. This is approximate, right? The G is not exactly that. But look at this. Uh, let me see. Did I flip something upside down? I think I did. What did I do wrong? It should be P naught over P G. Yeah, I flipped P naught over density G. Row, row. <laughs> Remember, row, 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 row your density. Yeah. Okay, so I screwed it up. It's P naught over row G, which is 10 to the fifth over 10 to the third times 10. I'm ignoring the units, but that's only 10 meters. So every 10 meters you go down, you go up by one atmospheric pressure or 10 to the fifth Newtons per meter squared. The area of your body, right? The surface area of your body is about two meters squared. Now, obviously, as you go deeper and deeper, the pressure on one side of your body and the other side is approximately the same. Technically, the part that's facing downwards would have a slight increase in pressure versus the top side. What would happen if you have a slightly higher pressure beneath you than above you? What direction is the force? It's up. Up. Effectively, that's why we float when we jump in a swimming pool, right? More on that in a minute. That's the buoyant force. That's the origins of it. We know there's more pressure down low than up high. And so there's naturally a pressure upwards, uh, a net pressure upwards. <sighs> More on that later. It's, it's tricky. It's not that simple. All right. Questions on pressure versus depth. Okay. So um, a classic thing that you'll see all the time, back before the internet, Scientists did YouTube a long time ago, okay? Scientists have been doing YouTube since the 1800s, ever since they could blow glass. To, to a physicist, a YouTube is literally a tube shaped like a U. <laughs> so dumb. Right? The idea here is this is a U-tube. It's shaped like a U. And one of the things that you could do is you could put some fluid in here. And if I fill this up, how high do you think the fluid level will go on the other side compared to this height? Will it go above or below that? What do you think? If I just pour water in here and it sloshes around and then I let it come to equilibrium, how high would it go on the other side? Same height. Same. same height. You've probably heard the phrase, fluids seek their own level. This is a variation on that theme. However, let's say I take a, a small amount of oil, right? And let's say I pour some oil in here. And let's say there's, this side is some water, which has uh, more density, water or oil, if you had to guess. Water. Water has more density. Oil tends to float on top. Okay. So if you do uh, have add some oil, that's going to mess with this. So now let's think about this. If I added some oil on here, let's say I start adding oil into here. We know the oil is going to end up being on top of the surface. If you had to guess, would the, uh, would the level of fluid on this side, which contains both oil and water, should it be higher or lower or the same as this side? And again, we're doing something that's an oil on top of water column here. What's your gut tell you? The oil side should be lower. Okay, so let's think about that. If the oil side's lower like this, let's say it's just a little bit lower. What would be true about the weight of water in this column versus the weight on this column? Would they balance or would they be not balanced? Not balanced. Okay. And so this side would be too light. So wouldn't this water tend to slosh it upwards and push it up? 
And in fact, it would. So we actually expect a level, I don't know if that made sense, but think about it. We basically could cut this crap in half, ignore everything below this line, which is basically you know, a tie. And what we're saying is the weight of this column should equal the weight of that column. And since oil is less dense, I need a little bit more oil than water to make this thing balance. So far, so good? You could use this type of apparatus to study the density of various materials. If you're curious, give me a sec. I don't want to make you do this problem, but it might be interesting to see it. What the heck is that problem? Look on page uh, 145, 14.34 uh, 14 and a half. I'm going to share a screen really quick. Whoops. What page was this? This is 145. If you're curious, you could see how this would be done and you could think about this stuff right here. So I got to be honest with you, this problem is probably harder than the exam question. So um, that said, if you really want to understand this or if you're you know, trying to learn about this, there, there you go. Um, this kind of shows you the, the math of that one. I think we're, yeah, oh, this is a cool one. Look at this one. Oh, yeah, this is kind of fun. All right, so that 14.35 is, oh man, I love this chapter. I just wish we had more time, we don't. So let's focus on, let's keep our eye on the prize. Let's get this material done with. All right, um, that's pressure versus depth. Now, I'm gonna combine this really quick. Let's say I have a big lake. Right. And what I want to do is build a dam. So what you're going to do, is you're going to take a giant slab of concrete or earth or something and stick it into the ground. So this stuff down here is the ground embedded in that ground is a piece of concrete say this is a super simple model of a dam and it's a terrible design but let's just focus on it in this case think about what we've just been studying approximately most of the time this is air it's going to be at pressure p naught okay this surface right here is also at P naught. And let me just get rid of some of these lines. Let me do it like this. Okay. So the idea is this is a big lake. We're holding it back. The surface of the lake is at atmospheric pressure. Okay. If the surface was not at atmospheric pressure, let's say that this was slightly lower, what would happen to the water if this was lower than atmospheric pressure? What direction would there be for a force if this was not atmospheric pressure? Like, let's say this was lower than atmospheric pressure here for some reason. There'd be a force on the water pointed which way? Up. Yeah. And we don't see lakes spontaneously turning into fountains and flying into the sky. Therefore... We know the top surface of a lake is usually at the same pressure as the air above it. Temporarily, you could get waves, and that might be affected by these pressure differentials. But for the most part, we're expecting here the pressure at the top of the lake. So watch what happens here. Right here, there's some pressure. As I go deeper, what happens to the pressure? As I go below the surface, what happens to the pressure? It's bigger and it gets bigger linearly. So you could look at this in a bunch of different ways, but the idea is the very bottom has got tremendous pressure on it. So maybe you've actually seen dams that do this instead, right? 
you have the dam be thickest at the bottom where the precious pressure is greatest. If you wanted to find the force on the dam, you could do an integral or something and add up all the different contributions of force times area, or because it varies linearly, we could just pick the average depth. You could take the average depth, get the pressure at the average depth times the area of the whole thing, and that would be the net force pushing it this way, minus P atmospheric times the area going this way, and you could compute the average force that's trying to make this bulge out. Now, if you, and this is a side view here, okay? If you look at this from a top view, You've probably seen this before where here's the lake. And then, whoops. A lot of times the dam will take this arched shape. And the reason you do that, and there's probably some rock here and some rock here. The idea is then you could use the arch to help oppose the tendency of the dam to blow out, okay? So um, let me see, isn't it probably? So Nick, yes, almost certainly that's the idea, almost certainly, but I'm not exactly sure. I would assume that is exactly the reason why, Nick, but um, since I haven't read about it, I don't wanna say that for sure. Oh, there you go. Okay. All right. Um, so this is damned design. Damned if you do, damned if you don't, whatever. Okay. Now, I'm done with pressure versus depth. I want to move on. Any questions about pressure versus depth? It's a cool principle. But I'm going to teach you a more oh, general. I'm sorry, what were you saying real quick about the, the reason it's arched? Oh, arches could support more load. So like the Roman arch, right? You could put more weight on top of it, and then that keeps it from falling apart. So arched structures can support extra loads, extra weight. So maybe you've seen a semi-truck, a flatbed semi-truck. If you look at it when it's empty and watch it on the side of the road, look for the slight bow. Have you seen that? No, I haven't. Oh. Okay, drive around until the final exam, nonstop, <laughs> looking for flatbed semis with no load. Okay. But if you look at them, you'll see even a semi is arched. The idea is when you put the load on there, it's going to flatten it out. Look at bridges, right? Yeah, like the right. Golden Gate Bridge is arched slightly. Okay. Get this. Supposedly, when they first opened the Golden Gate Bridge, they let people walk on it on day one. And there were so many people that showed up, they flattened it. It was arched before the people got on it. And so many people walked on it. It literally flattened out. That's the story that I heard. And I think they have photos. You could check that out on the internet. But yeah, so arched structures, right? Think about it. If you just have something flat and then you put a bunch of weight on it, it's going to naturally start caving in right away. So by arching it, that opposes that tendency to collapse the middle. Good enough? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. There's, there's a lot that goes into that. You could study uh, civil engineering and, and learn more. All right, good. Other questions? All right. Now, let me see where I wanted to go next. Look on page 135. I'm going to bring it up just because there's a lot of information on there. Page 135, I believe is what I said here. Whoops, not three. Ah, oh, the good old days. There we go. All right. Now, buoyant force. There's a lot of different ways to explain it. This is, in my experience, after years of teaching, after writing this chapter, which was the hardest chapter in the entire book to write, is probably the most correct statement you could say. That doesn't mean it's easy to understand, but um, yeah. So the combination of this one for understanding a concept and this one for understanding a calculation is what you need. 
All right. So what we say is the buoyant force on an object is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. All right. And you know what I should do? I should literally get a hold on. I'll be right back. You guys read this just a sec. All right. Sorry for that. I should have thought of this before. Let me just show you a picture or a simulation here. All right. Here we go. So I've got a glass here. <laughs> All right. Sorry, there's writing on there. Okay. So right now, just kind of keep an eye on that volume level. Here's an object. I'm going to put this in there. Watch the water level. I hope you agree it went up slightly. There, if I force it under, you can see it. Look at that. So we see what's happening here is when I put something in water, the water level is displaced upwards. You could calculate the amount of water that moved upwards. And it's tricky because remember, it's not like you could just take this radius of this cup say pi r squared times the depth, because there's also some fraction of its loss due to this. So it's complicated, and I'll show you how to do it in just a minute. But the idea is you could calculate, now here's an object that's floating. In this case, what should be true about the amount of weight downwards and the buoyant force upwards? Three equal. Okay. Let's, I've got some other objects here for fun. When I was in grad school, I loved this game. It was called Float No Float. I'm going to take this tomato and stick it in here. What's your guess? Float or not float? Float. Oh, no float. Watermelon floats. Tomato, watermelon just barely floats. So watermelon's a good one, but this cup isn't quite big enough. <laughs> All right. So in this case, what does this tell you about the buoyant force and the weight? Weight is stronger. Okay. Are there any other forces acting on the tomato right now other than the buoyant force and the weight? Normal force from the cup. Normal force. So this is the thing in a nutshell. If you got something floating, you got a buoyant force and mg. If you got something that sinks all the way to the bottom, you got buoyant force plus normal force equals mg. Got it? What if I stuck a string on here? You could have a tension plus a buoyant force equals mg. Or let's say I put a spring on here, forcing this thing under. I could put a spring on and force it. Then you'd say uh, mg plus the force of the spring 
equals uh, the buoyant force, things like that. Or you could have a normal force, a buoyant force, a string force, all this crap. You know, I better get this tomato out of here. I'll, I'll let you know if my kid gets pissed off that I soaked her lip balm in water all day. Okay. If I get a bad report, you'll know why. I'm just getting this out of here real quick. All right. So here's the deal. When we're doing these problems, let's say we're doing a general buoyant force problem. Okay. Okay. There's going to be a couple of things that show up. Okay. In this case, uh, we would say this is a floating object, right? So for a floating case, oh, and let me check the chat here. Sorry if I'm slow. Oh, that was angel. Okay. So in this case, the tomato was close to floating, by the way. It was close, just didn't quite make it. You could imagine it's filled with water, right? Water should float in water just barely. If you don't believe me, fill up a water balloon, throw it in the sink. There's always at least one tiny air bubble, and that's usually enough to keep it floating. Even though, yeah, okay. So the other way you could do it is take a garbage bag and fill it with water and stick it in there. So yeah, you could try that. Stick a garbage bag filled with water in your sink. Should just sit there and do nothing. But in general, if it's, so this object is probably less dense than water because it floats. So if it's floating, it's either gonna be partially or wholly submerged. So you have some object that's either partially submerged or wholly submerged. In this case, we would say the buoyant force should equal mg. Seems easy enough. However, here is something I want you to get some practice with. In general, density is the density of an object is the mass of that object over the volume of that object. Okay? If we rearrange this, in this chapter, we almost always write the mass of the object, flipping this around, is density of the object times the volume of the object. Notice I use a capital V. This is my way of drawing a capital V for volume. Lowercase v is speed. We're going to be using that in the next problems. So you have to be careful in this chapter with lowercase versus uppercase, rho versus p versus capital P, lowercase v versus uppercase v. All right. If I use this result, check this out. The buoyant force by definition is density of the fluid times volume displaced times G. Whereas this is density of the object times volume of the entire object times G. This is the issue in a nutshell for this type of problems. Over here, the buoyant force relates to the density of the fluid displaced. The volume displaced in this particular case is not the same thing as the volume of the object. Okay? So in this particular example, maybe 30% is sitting above the water or something. I don't know. I do see in this simple case, the Gs drop out. This should be the same on Earth as it is on Mars. The densities of the fluids are what matter. Okay, so the amount of gravitational force from the planet you're on doesn't seem to matter. Cool. Notice in this case, I could solve this for the volume displaced. If I solve this, I see the displaced volume should equal, in this case, the density of the object over the density of the fluid times the volume of the object. Now think. Does this make sense? Is our displaced volume, should it be bigger than or less than the total volume in this case? 
we expect the displaced volume should be less than the total volume for this scenario. In this case, density of our object is lighter than the density of the fluid. Where if something floats, it's made out of a low density material. So this low density over standard water density should be a fraction less than one. The object should float and displace. Think about ice. How much of an iceberg is below the surface? You've heard this in your life. Most of it. Yeah, 90%. Hmm. I bet the density of ice is 90% the density of water. So think about this. If you go to the club and you get a drink and the ice sinks, why is that a good thing? Or is it? If you go to the club, you get a drink. I know it's COVID, so maybe none of you know what a club is anymore. Me neither. Why would it be a good or a bad thing if you put some ice in here and the ice sinks to the bottom? What would that say about the density? The density is greater than water? Uh, the density of, careful, what would it, okay, the ice is the density of ice. What would it say about the density of your drink if the ice cubes sink? Okay, so I put ice cubes in a drink. If they sink, what must be true about the density of the fluid compared to the density of the ice if ice sinks? The density of the fluid is greater than the ice. The density of the fluid is less oh, than. Less and less and less. Yes. Now, conveniently, I happen to know the density of water is one gram per centimeter cube. The density of ice is 0.9. What's the density of alcohol? 0.8. If your ice cubes sink, that's a strong drink. You're ready to go to the club. All right. That's my, that's my drinking physics for you if you need that. Whatever. We don't go to clubs anymore. It's COVID times. All right. Be aware of that. Or watch out. If your ice cubes sink, somebody's trying to really get you wasted. So be, be careful. All right. There you go. Now you know how to check the alcohol content of your drink. If your ice cubes just barely float, it's 50-50 water and, uh, and alcohol pretty much. Or yeah, all right, enough on that. Okay, what are the challenges we face with buoyant force problems? All right, not all objects are just solid objects. For example, does anybody happen to know the density of iron? approximately do you think it's yeah i don't do you, do you know any common densities for iron 55.85 oh i've never used those units um it might are yeah so how about let's do this let's do some simple ones so the oh group is about 0 0.8 grams per centimeter cubed or notice that's 800 kilograms per meter cubed. So that's alcohol. Density of ice, I'm just gonna cheat and say 0 0.9. Sometimes people say this is the specific gravity. So this is the density of ice divided by the density of water. The density of H2O is just 1.0. So if you, right, if you divide by the density of water, all the units drop out. So this is called the specific gravity. It's technically the density of ice divided by the density of H2O. That just saves us time writing the units. So the density of aluminum is about 2.7, I think. Maybe it's 2.3, I forget. I think it's 2.7. Density of iron is about eight. About eight times. I think it's more like seven. If you make steel, it could be somewhere from 7.6 up to 7.9, depending on the amount of carbon and things like that. But let's just call it eight, all right? So iron is eight times more dense than water. Steel is about eight times as dense. What do they make naval vessels out of? What do they make giant aircraft carriers out of usually? 
steel, the, the, yeah. the, and then they cover them with copper, I think, to or some kind of anti-oxidated uh, metal. Yeah. So, but it's reasonable to assume that a lot of a of a naval vessel is made out of iron. Why doesn't it sink? It displaces a lot of water. But what? Wait, I just did this calculation. If I let's say this is my boat, right? And this is the water level. If the boat is made out of iron, right? And the fluid is water. And we know the density of iron is eight times the density of H2O. How, whoops, there we go. The density of iron that this actual piece of black metal is made out of, and maybe I'll just do this here. How can I get this thing to float? How do you make it displace enough water to float it? A large area. Okay. If I just take a giant flat plate of iron and stick it on top of the water, that'd have a huge area. What would happen to a giant flat plate of iron? It'd sink. Yeah, unless it was exceedingly thin. Have you ever taken a needle and put a needle on the surface of water? You could actually float a needle because of the surface tension, but that's a different situation. If we ignore making it so thin that you could use surface tension, yeah, if you put an iron plate, it's going to sink. So it's not just the area. What is the main quality of a, of a naval vessel that allows it to... Go ahead. Isn't there like air pockets at the bottom of the ship? It's hollow. Yeah. Yeah, right? So mm -hmm. think about this. Take a piece of aluminum foil and fold it into the shape of a boat and you can stick some stuff in it and it won't sink. So what you're doing is if you make this thing hollow... It's, it floats. Now, here's where our calculation gets sneaky. Take a look here. I would say, uh, if we say the buoyant force from the water equals mg, this is a trickier question. So if I could, I'm going to color it in. That is the volume displaced. It's the amount of water that should have been there that is no longer there. So this is the volume displaced. The buoyant force uses the density of the fluid times the volume displaced, which is just the amount that is below the surface that would have been there and filled up that bowl, so to speak. Okay, times G. One too many pens here. Okay. Next, this mass is the density of iron times the volume of the boat times G. Now be careful. The volume of the boat is not that. That is not right. The volume of the boat is literally the volume of metal used. So it's the volume of the edge. You'd have to figure out the area of the boat, the surface area, times the thickness of the metal. Do you see the subtle difference there? The volume displaced is literally how much water you pushed out of the way based on where's the water level outside the fluid and how high would it fill up inside the boat. Whereas the volume of metal is literally the volume of just the edge of the structure, not the volume of everything inside it. Does that make sense? Are we good on that? Yeah. Okay. It's sneaky. It's sneaky. All right. That's essentially it. Um, let me do one more example here. This problem made me go almost insane for like a week straight. So I don't want to spend too much time on it because it'll drive you nuts too. So I'm going to start with this. And let's say we have some fluid here. Right? And let's say we stick our tomato in here.
And this, this time, let's just deal with a solid object. What are the forces on this object right now? And let me give myself some room to work here. What's one force acting on this tomato right now? A buoyant force up. Got a buoyant force up. What else? Energy down. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Normal force. Yeah. And so don't overthink it. Obviously, the normal force, the tank doesn't have to support the whole weight. If you've ever jumped in a swimming pool and stood on the bottom, it's nice to be in a swimming pool because you don't feel as heavy. The ground is supporting some of your weight, but the water is also displaced by your body. And so to be clear, the water level was displaced. Now, it just turns out in this case, if the entire solid object is below the surface, the volume displaced should equal the volume of the object if it's fully submerged. If fully submerged, and not hollow, that's two big points to make. If it's fully submerged all the way under the surface and it's a solid object, then I know that the volume displaced should equal volume of the object. But there's an extra force acting on it if it hits the bottom. Cool. All right, um, so in this case, this one we could use rho of the fluid volume of the object because all of it is under there times G plus the normal force equals density of the object itself times volume of the object itself times G. And if you wanted to, I could give you say two of the three and say, find the third thing. Like, let's say I give you this problem and say, figure out the density of the object. Well, then I'd have to tell you the normal force and this stuff. Or let's say I figure out, figure out the radius of the tomato. If I ask you to figure out the radius of the tomato, then let's see, I'd have to give you the density of this, the normal force, the density of that, and the radius would come into play in the volume. It's, I don't know, um, that's some ideas on ways you could have a submerged object problem. I wanna pause and see if there's any questions on that. So in this case, fully submerged, these two things are equal. That's why I can do it here and here. You cannot always do that. All right, now um, let's take a very, very brief bathroom break. I wanna keep rolling. I, I wanna try and get as much done today as I can. Um, so let's take a four minute break. I know that's short, but we're probably gonna cut off class early on Wednesday. So let's just take a four minute break, everybody. So my clock says approximately 1.27. Oh, let's do five minutes. So let's go 1.32 on my clock. All right, so five minute break, come right back, be ready to work.
All right. Okay. So I'm going to show you something really quick here on page 136. Do a quick screen share. Oops. So if you're curious about the origins of the buoyant force, imagine right here. Uh, I'll show you these two things really quick, and then we'll go on to fluids in motion. You know, as you go deeper into the object, the pressure should increase. Obviously, the forces side to side balance from those forces, but underneath, if you want, you could draw along with me. This is actually at the bottom of page 135. If you look at this, I hope you agree that there's a net force associated with that change in pressure. Upwards. That is what I've been calling the buoyant force. However, as I mentioned very briefly, it's not quite the, the same thing here. All right. Um, oh, weird. I wonder why that note is way down there, but. Okay, so that's, that's similar to this buoyant force. Uh, in, in reality, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. So if I go to the next page, what if you have objects that are sitting at the bottom of a swimming pool? Students oftentimes have trouble seeing that, wait a minute, the block, how does water get underneath the block? Right. So how does water get underneath the block? They could see how water gets underneath the sphere, but sometimes they're like, well, there's no water underneath the block there. Why should there be a buoyant force upwards? And this is the main reason I think it's better to think about it this way. If you put a block in the water, the water level went up. Now think about this, that water level would like to fill in that void if you move the block out of the way. Said another way, by putting the block in here, it forced all this water up, right? So you're displacing this water around the block. So you get this buoyant force from the fluid displacement. Um, so that's where I would rather, rather than trying to debate all day about what's going on at this surface, I want you to just say, look, if you've displaced water, if it displaces water, it has a buoyant force upwards. That's what I want you to think conceptually. Now, this is where I started to lose my mind, right? You could start imagining you, you glue something to the floor of a pool. Well, then should it have a buoyant force up or not? And, and you could think about it. And yeah, there's all kinds of things you could think about that might drive you crazy. Or what if you stick a plunger on the surface of a, on the bottom of a pool, right? This is supposed to be a plunger drawn here, right? And it's, let's say it starts out as an empty pool. Then you should say, well, is this plunger actually affixed, right? To the, um, to the bottom of the pool. Is the plunger attached to the bottom of the pool? And then as such, is it got a pressure downwards on it? Or is it something that's less dense than water? Does it have a buoyant force up? So as you fill this up with fluid, what's going to happen to this thing? Who knows? It's very confusing. I just want you to think about it this way. If something is displacing water or displacing fluids, there's a buoyant force upwards. For example, right now, is there a buoyant force on me right now? No. Yes, there is. You're displacing what? air. Air. Now think about it. What's the density of air? Let's compare. The density of H2O is approximately 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. Does anybody happen to know the density of air? If you had to guess. one point three kilograms per meter cubed so the the reason i don't notice the buoyant force of this ocean of air that i'm swimming in right now 
is because the buoyant force from it is about a thousand times smaller than any buoyant force from a real swimming pool filled with water. So, right, there is a buoyant force on you. It's just a thousand times smaller than the buoyant force you feel in a pool. Now, here's how I remember this one, as strange as this may be. A refrigerator has a volume of about a meter cubed. A kilogram is about 2.2 pounds. So I had read once from Paul Hewitt. He's a scientist that wrote conceptual physics books. He says the amount of air in your refrigerator weighs about as much as a dozen eggs. That's a strange unit, but it works. A refrigerator is about a meter cubed of air inside. And so then the um, two pounds for a dozen eggs seems about right. So just, yeah, this is a very weird thing to think about, but it's about two pounds for a meter cubed of air. That's not much, uh, yeah, not much stuff there. All right, whatever. I have a question real quick. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> it says buoyant force is only calculated by uh, density and volume, right? Right. When, some, when something sinks, because I always imagine that as, as things sink, the pressure changes. Ah. I, would get, I would get to a point where, <clears throat> I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, so if something sinks, would it always sink all the way to the bottom or would let's, it get to a let's, point? Let's take a look at that problem. Okay. Okay. So let's say this is the surface of the ocean at atmospheric pressure. What's a common object that might be below the surface of the ocean, let's say? Maybe it's like a fish. Okay. I was going to say a scuba diver. Okay. And because I'm lazy, let's say the scuba diver is a sphere. All right. So right now, let's say the scuba diver is under the surface of the water. In theory, they're, do you agree they can change their density a little bit? A scuba diver can? Maybe you don't know how, but they basically have air bubbles on their suits. And they could change the volume of those air bubbles until their density matches exactly the density of water at that depth. So here's what we know. If this is P naught, right here might be 2P naught, 3P naught, 4P naught. We know the pressure should increase as you go deeper, right? Uh, and I think we said this is every 10 meters. Didn't we figure that out earlier? I think it was every 10 meters. The pressure goes up. So now... Let's say you're sitting here, you're a scuba diver. There's a buoyant force up and there's an MG down. It's possible this buoyant force, which is given by, I'm gonna write it over here. The buoyant force is equal to density of the fluid times volume displaced times G. Now, it's possible you could be accelerating up or down, right? What if your volume displaced is a little bit too small? The buoyant force would cause you to drift towards the surface. If your volume displaced is a little bit too small, you'll tend to drift downwards. Do you agree with that, Esteban? Yeah. Now, as you go deep, let's do the case where Let's say you didn't have this dialed in and your volume displaced is a little bit too low. Let's say you drift downwards a little bit. As you drift downwards, do you think your weight is going to change if you're down here? No. <clears throat> so that's going to stay the same. What should happen to your volume displaced? Should be the same. Is it? Are you incompressible? No, I, guess I stick not. you. I could stick you in a ten-ton press and squish, squish. Yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. So now think about this. Let's say we go downwards a little bit. The water is going to push harder and harder on you. The air bubbles in your swimsuit and your lungs are going to be slightly compressed. So what would happen? This is a, obviously a very dramatic change. We might expect your volume displaced to get dramatically, well, subtly smaller. So what should happen to your buoyant force? Get smaller? 
So what should happen to your acceleration? It'll increase downwards. And so let's say you're diving really deep and you start to lose consciousness and you're not paying attention. If you go a little bit too deep, you're going to start falling and accelerating and you're not coming back. So if you go diving, deep sea diving off the continental shelf, you could just black out and just keep going forever. And that's so, it. So what happens if something doesn't change, change its volume? So you say ah, it's a piece then of you, steel. Then if something doesn't change its volume, it would go down at a constant rate. So for example, a submarine. The submarine is made out of iron and it's not going to compress that easily. But if you go too deep, it's just going to crush the submarine and kill everybody inside. So what I'm saying is if something is dense enough for it to sink and you yes. drop it in the middle of the ocean yes. and, it, and it's not compressible, it yeah. will just fall all the way to the bottom, regardless yeah. of the pressure at the bottom. Right. Because remember, the buoyant force is not dependent on the pressure directly. It's pressure right. differences. Right. And right. the pressure difference between the top and the bottom should always be about the same. Right. Now, okay. again, I don't really like going with that intuition because I like to think about it as volume displaced mm -hmm. because again, just for that issue that I was talking about block on the bottom of a swimming pool is confusing. If you think about pressure up, because how does the fluid get under there? But if mm -hmm. we think about this as if you have an object that's incompressible, solid steel sphere, right? If you drop it in there, the buoyant force is fixed in size because the volume of the sphere is not changing appreciably. It's going to sink and it's going to sink at a constant rate. Mm -hmm. Now there, we also run into another challenge drag. So the drag forces associated with air are much smaller than the drag forces associated with a more viscous fluid like water, right? Or corn syrup, even more so. So at some point, there's probably going to be another force here called drag. And that would be proportional. Usually it's either to alpha V squared or to beta V, depending on whether you're in the high or low speed regime and you could take a fluids class to learn more. There, we're glossing over this. So, okay. yeah. All right. Here's, this, is, this is good. How about the flip side? Let's say I'm scuba diving and I blow a bubble right here. What's going to happen to the bubble? What do bubbles do? It rise all the way to the top. As the bubble rises, what's going to happen to it? It should increase in volume. Yeah. So if you could make a bubble ring, if you could blow a ring, you could watch it go upwards and it should turn into this giant bubble ring and you can see videos online of dolphins doing this stuff go check it out dolphin bubble rings all right with all your free time good enough right uh good stuff it's fun to think about this would be a complicated problem to do on paper and pencil any ideas how you could analyze the motion of something like this in the real world code it right it'd be pretty easy to code you just calculate the depth you calculate how much the volume changes using the bulk modulus equation from chapter 12 that we didn't cover. <sighs> do a bunch of math. And it would be easy to animate. It would be hard to do paper and pencil because it'd be a complicated differential equation to solve. Easy encoding. All right. Um, now, I know I'm rushing through this. I know that after class on Wednesday, we can do more worked problems. That said, I want to cover the last main topic and leave wednesday's class just for exercises and extra problems so let's look at the last little bit of this chapter that's required of you maybe come on zoom is it doing it hold on let me try again zoom's locking up on me here is can you guys see that? Oh, there we go. Sorry, it was just hold. Okay, now can you see my screen? Hopefully, is it up there for you? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, one forty-one. Okay. Now I want to talk to you about flowing fluids. We are going to do only the simplest, most easy fluid problems in motion you could imagine real life fluid problems are extremely difficult i can go into this more later but i just want to point out um look at this right here uh these are our terms okay 
I'm going to go through them in a minute, but we're going to focus on no drag, constant density, meaning in compressor. And we're going to talk only about what's called laminar flow. So that means no turbulence, no vortices or eddies. Very few fluid flows in real life are modeled this way. That said, we did this in chapter four and ignored air resistance, and we learned a lot about projectiles. So let's start simple. And if you want to go into aerospace or fluid mechanics, boy, there's a bunch of really cool stuff. You're going to have to code, have to, have to, have to code. And it's really neat, um, but it's complicated in a hurry. So let's look carefully at these terms, okay? Uh, let me get my annotator out. Row, row, row your density. Got it. A is going to be the cross-sectional area. So think about a random arbitrary space, and you just define a cross-sectional area. Now, in practice, that cross-sectional area might be the cross-sectional area of a pipe or a hose. So for a lot of the problems, just imagine we have fluid flowing through a pipe, okay? So that's what that's talking about, the area of the pipe cross-sectional area, not the area of the sidewall. Capital R is called the volume flow rate. We're going to use gallons per minute if you wanted to think about that, or liters per second. In practice, units for physics, I don't know why I didn't write them. Normally, we would do meters cubed per second. So write that in there. The normal units we're going to use for volume flow rate is volume per second. Be careful. Speed is different. Speed is how many meters per second you have for a chunk of fluid. So, right, if you imagine just one water droplet, it's moving this way at speed V. Whereas if I want to talk about the rate, the rate is how many meters cubed per second are flowing through the entire hose. So there's a difference between R, the rate, and V, the speed. This one drives students nuts. Physicists, when they say the word pressure, they mean static pressure. What does that mean? It's the force per unit area exerted by the fluid perpendicular to the fluid flow. So in this case, this would be the direction of pressure. This would be the direction of pressure. Sorry, those arrows are different size. Right. And then you could even imagine one coming out of the page, but not this way. Not that is not the direction of pressure. So when a physicist says the word pressure, they mean the force per unit area perpendicular to fluid flow. Now, most students often think about dynamic pressure as pressure. So a lot of students have this misconception. When I want to talk about dynamic pressure, that's the pressure this direction. It relates to the velocity. So I'll call that Q. Q is essentially one half density V squared. If you punch in the numbers for that, this has units of pressure. So it's a lot like kinetic energy. And in fact, it is. It's kinetic energy divided by what? Kinetic energy is one half mv squared. How do you get from m to density? Multiply by volume. Yeah, so we're going to have to have a divide by volume to get this calculation. Now, total pressure would be add those two things together. All right. So pressure. I want you to think about as being this area perpendicular to fluid flow, all right? Is this perfect? No, but I think this will help you at the level you are at, okay? I just want to emphasize, if you really want to understand fluids, you have to take advanced courses, period. This is not enough to learn everything. That's, but okay. A couple more things here. Um, or any questions about those before we move on? Dynamic pressure versus static pressure. All right. 
Now, um, a streamline, that's a path that the fluid uh, travels. Uh, if we have no vortices, we're, ex we're expecting that the streamlines never cross. So look, they never cross in the picture up above if we're making these assumptions, no turbulence, eddies, and vortices, okay? So we're gonna have smooth streamlines, okay? That's what laminar flow means. Laminar just means layered, okay? So uh, laminar flow means the fluid could be thought of in layers where the streamlines never cross. All right, down here, we see some important equations. These are the two most important equations that you're gonna have for fluids in motion. Number one, the amount of fluid coming into a pipe should equal the amount of fluid going out of a pipe, even if the size of the pipe changes. So let's say we have fluid in, I'll call that rate one, and the fluid is coming out at the other side, rate two. My claim is that the rate coming in, rate one, should equal the rate going out. If I have 600 gallons coming in per minute, I had better have 600 gallons going out or the pipe will explode or cave in, right? If you don't have the same amount of shit coming in and going out, there's an explosion or something is going to break. That's just the facts. So we are going to assume that the amount of fluid coming into a system equals the amount of fluid going out. If you look, this is meter squared times meters per second. Notice you get the volume flow rate. Everybody see that? Meters squared times meters per second gives you volume flow rate. So that's how the speed and the volume flow rate relate. They're obviously related. Okay, rate one, you might add this in, is equal to rate two. That also tells you how the fluid rate relates to the fluid speed. Very subtle. The volume flow rate relates to the speed. And you know this already. Think about this. What happens, let's say you have a garden hose and you put your thumb over the end. You decrease the area. What happens to the speed of the water? It increases. It increases. If you cover up part of the nozzle, it flies out faster. So, but the same amount of water has to come in and out. So the idea is if you cover up part of the hole, the water has to move faster. Otherwise, there's a buildup of water inside the hose and it explodes. If the hose doesn't explode, the amount of water coming in one end equals the amount of water going out the other end. No big deal. Okay, hold on. Oh my gosh, this is slow. All right. Now, this equation right here looks pretty scary, but let's go through it. This Bernoulli equation, this is static pressure. This is dynamic pressure. So combined, these two things are total pressure. And I don't know if you could see, if you think of it like that, it's a variation on pressure versus depth. However, this is gonna drive you a little bit crazy. I actually like this equation and completely ignore the pressure versus depth equation. However, H in here is height, not depth. And I'm, I'm not trying to be mean to you. This is what every single physics book I've ever seen has done. This is how I remember it. This equation is essentially energy initial equals energy final for fluids. This is the energy equation. This is like the kinetic energy, except you're dividing both sides by the volume of fluid. So it's the conservation of energy per unit volume equation, whatever. You might be saying, well, wait, what's this pressure differential here? Check this out. You're going to get a P2, whoops, a P1 minus P2. 
That's a delta P. Well, a delta P times an area equals a force, right? And if I multiply that, uh, whoops, let me do it this way. Delta P times area equals a force. Well, if I take that force and I multiply by a small distance, say dx, that's work. And notice this equation right here is basically the work done per unit volume. If I include these two pressures. So the pressure differential relates to this work term. So blah, 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 blah. This is conservation of energy. That's what I want you to know. Okay, it's conservation of energy for fluids. And that's for two points on a streamline. Whoa, that's a lot to take in. I wanna pause for questions. And while you're thinking about that, let me see if I can do something really quick. Where is my, gosh, this thing is, there it is. I'm gonna get my simulation ready, okay? Oh, whoops, I guess, I, I guess I'm doing it right here. Should have had this open already. Sorry about that. Any questions while this is opening up? Okay. One more drink here. Sorry for not having this open in advance. So if you want this link to play with later, let me just do that. I'll throw this in the chat. In a second. There you go. So that's in the chat now if you need it. And where did, ah, crap, come on. Man, my... um. Getting a lot of lag here. Sorry about that. Okay. Let me get this up here. Those of you that have already seen this, my apologies. The idea right now is we're ignoring friction. So notice we're ignoring friction right here. Hopefully you could see this. And um, maybe what I'll do is I'll just do this. I could hit this button here. And we could see that for a pipe of uniform uh, radius, if we ignore friction, the water just flows right through. If I add in some friction, which we're not going to, you can see this gets very tricky. There's lots of friction at the edge. So the particles in the middle are going to go faster than the ones on the edge. Like I said, we're going to ignore friction, even though it's a huge deal in the real world. So now let's say I take this pipe, I'm going to lower it down a little bit. Maybe I'll raise this end up. Can I go any lower? That's about it. So at this point, and maybe let's do this. Let's make the middle go really, really skinny here. Go a little bit higher. Sorry about this. So hopefully this is working on your machine. Let's analyze what's going on here. The idea here is this is the pressure at this spot. The speed at this spot is about 1.6. So notice if I was writing this on the board and drawing this problem out, I know this isn't perfect, but this is my attempt to draw that. We're doing an energy problem which is essentially Bernoulli. 
what's one of the first things we did in an energy problem with gravity? References. Reference level. What was usually the reference level in any gravity problem if we could do it? Bottom was zero. Bottom is usually what we call zero. So we're gonna say this is height equals zero. Right here, this would be height one equals, uh, let's just say H. And let's say right here, let's say height two is equal to uh, two H or whatever. And I'll say down here, we'll say height zero equals zero. So the idea, if I could, is we're specifying heights just like this. Our Bernoulli equation, if we try to do the equation, what we'd say is pressure at the bottom. Boy, zero is a really bad number. I'm sorry. I'm going to change this to one, okay? Just because I don't want to say, just sorry. Okay, I'm sorry about that. So now what I could do is I could say the pressure at position one, going in all these different directions, that's the pressure. Technically, it goes forwards back to, but yeah, whatever. Plus the dynamic pressure. Plus the depth. Should equal the pressure at point two What we are saying in the Bernoulli equation is if I compare two points in this pipe and ignore any turbulence, ignore any friction, what I could say is the pressure plus the dynamic pressure plus the pressure versus depth term all should equal. In this case, what should be true about the density here versus the density there if we're talking about water? How much does the density change as we go deeper and deeper into water? What's your guess? A lot or a little? Not at all. It does change, but a very, very, very tiny amount. Strictly speaking, imagine if you took a wet sponge, right? If you took a wet sponge and stacked a bunch of stuff on top of it, it would compress slightly, right? Now, water by itself would compress a lot less than a wet sponge because there's no air in there. But it, so... We're going to assume density two is essentially equal to density one, like you said. So that allows us to just change this. That is a property of an incompressible fluid. If we view the fluid as incompressible, this is true. Nice job. So that allows me to get rid of at least one subscript here because the densities at the two levels does not change anywhere near the amount the pressure changes. By comparison, the density might change a thousand times less than the amount the pressure changes. All right. Okay. In this case, we could plug in these different numbers and see what should happen. What do you think should be true about the speed here? Should it be, or if you recall, this was 1.6 down here. The velocity one was 1 1.6 meters per second. What should be true about the velocity here? Go ahead and walk me through your thought process. Tell you what, let's just look at it. Down here, it's 1.6. If I go up to here, I see it's a lot faster because there's that narrow constriction. What should be true about the pressure if I go up there? It's a lot lower. So notice this trade-off. 
Was is that static pressure or dynamic pressure? That's that's measuring, that's measuring static pressure. If I say okay. pressure, I mean static pressure. I mean P. Okay. Good question. Good question. The idea here is, and this is tough for students that are just beginning. Generally speaking, as you go up, right, we'd expect less pressure. So that's a little bit challenging. But if you reduce the area, here's the other equation. Remember, area one, V1 equals area two, V2. This turns out to be much more important. If I look at this, I notice that volume, or I just said volume, I meant speed two is equal to speed one times the inverse, uh, wait, times area one, the ratio of the areas. Give me a second. So in this case, think about it. If area two is smaller, this fraction gets big, the speed goes up. This was the garden hose thumb over the end thing. Okay, if you reduce the area, the output speed is higher. So if I go back to my simulation, right, in this case, this is a complicated situation where the speed is changing because I reduced the area. The pressure is also going down, right? Now, what is happening to the height? The height is going up. So we could keep going over to here. Notice the speed at the beginning and the end are almost exactly the same. There, now they're the same. 1.6, 1.6. The speed is the same. Here, the pressure is 129. What should be the pressure when I go up to the top? The areas are the same. The speeds are the same. What should be true about the pressure if I go up? Lower pressure. There it is. So we see here, if I could, in this case, as you go upwards, generally speaking, we expect either the pressure to drop or the speed to drop. Now you could do it, in, you could do this very complicated, right? You could shrink the size of the pipe and increase the speed. That's going to decrease the pressure even more, right? Now you could actually open this thing way up and we see that the pressure almost, yeah, that you could, okay, moral of the story, this equation can help you understand a complicated problem where you have pressure, dynamic pressure or fluid flow and depth. This is a better equation than the pressure versus depth equation. It's basically pressure versus depth, but it adds in a factor for accounting for fluid motion and kinetic energy. So. Whoa, I probably did a bad job on that, but um, let me see if this makes some sense to you. Instead of pressure versus depth, I want you using this equation. This equation works if the fluid is at rest. If the fluid is at rest, you get back a modified version of pressure versus depth. It's called pressure versus height. But this makes sense to a physicist because we usually talk about conservation of energy using heights. Questions? So the static pressure is related to the height and also the speed at which the, the fluid is flowing? Correct. Okay. So the simple case of pressure versus depth doesn't work if the fluid is flowing. If the fluid is flowing, this is the equation that gets you a better approximation. Yeah, yeah. Should we do a quick workbook problem and see if this makes sense? We've got a few minutes. Let's try one. Okay. I mean, nobody, nobody's going to use this stuff except for maybe uh, somebody that's in aerospace, right, Ryan? <laughs> heck yeah all right so we're talking about flow uh, fluid flows and pressure so right we're almost done with class give me a sec so ryan's Not aerospace all right so in this case um here's a a fun problem to do so let me get this a little bit smaller here 14.20 mm. all right 
let's just get as far as we can. Then we'll probably pick up with this next time. This is on page 142 in the workbook volume two. All right. So imagine you take, let me just draw it like this. Imagine I take this glass and I just drill the hole in it somewhere. You know that there'd be water that's open to the air and there'd be a hole and the fluid could come squirting out. This is pretty reasonable to think about. Obviously you might do this with a metal can so it's a lot easier to drill the hole, all right? That's what this problem is talking about. Now, right here, imagine there's a hole drilled in here. What's the pressure right here above the fluid? Right now? 10 to the fifth newtons per yeah. meter. Meter squared, yeah. Square. One pat, uh, yeah. 10 to the fifth or one ATM or 10 to the fifth newtons per meter squared. If there's a hole here and the fluid's coming out, do you agree the fluid is exposed to air? Again, at the hole. What is the pressure as the water comes flying out if it's exposed to air right there? I'm going to call this P naught. I'm going to cheat and call it one ATM. Or like I said, that's approximately 10 to the fifth Pascals. And remember that one Pascal is a Newton per meter squared. We saw that in the simulation, a common unit was uh, kilopascals. Anyways, right here, think about it. There's atmospheric pressure pushing both sides on the water. If the water stream is not exploding outwards, if it's staying in a stream, I know the pressure in the water has to equal that atmospheric pressure there as well. So this is a very weird scenario where you get atmospheric pressure at the top because you're open to air and atmospheric pressure at the bottom because you're also open to air where the hole is. Questions about that? That's weird. Okay. I'll just sketch you through how you could do this one. Woof. We'll pick this up next time because it's time to go, but I just want to point out here, we could use the continuity equation. A1 V1 equals A2 V2. We could use this to analyze and compare the motion right here. We could call this speed V2 to the rate at which water flows out, flows downwards. So for example, up here, give me a second. Oh my gosh, I'm doing such a bad job. Let me just do it like this really quick. This would be the speed at which the water is going out. V1 would be the rate at which the water level is going down. That's not the same as rate one, which is the product of area one and the speed. So velocity one is literally how fast is the water level dropping? And usually in this problem, you make a very small hole so that this doesn't drop very quickly. As a result, that term is negligible. I know it's time to go. We're gonna pick this up next time, but uh, right here, if you wanted to figure out the horizontal distance traveled, oh wait, okay, sorry. For part B, you use the Bernoulli equation. And then for part C, we use projectiles. We're going to pick up here next time. Let's stop the share and stop the live stream.